man, amen. Oh, you blessed us today. He's more than wonderful. That's what Jesus is to me. Oh, thank you, Lord. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Oh, I'm going to pray and get into the word now. And bow your heads with me. Father God, thank you for how wonderful you are. You're more than wonderful to us. As we open your holy word, I ask that you would cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Fill my life with your Holy Spirit's presence and power. Speak to me, through me, and for me. And I promise you, Lord, I'll always give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, for over 21 years, I've stood at this pulpit, opening prayerfully, carefully, faithfully the Word of God. What a privilege it is. What an honor it is. My message this morning, and for those who made the trek to the first three rows, amen. You're in a battle, you will win. You're in a battle, you will win. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 20, beginning reading verse 27 through verse 30. The Bible says, Then led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem, for the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. They entered Jerusalem and went to the temple of the Lord with harps and lyres and trumps, trumpets. The fear of God came on all the surrounding kingdoms when they heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. And the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. You're in a battle. You will win. In the book of Chronicles, the Bible tells us that the reign of the young king Jehoshaphat was a time of renaissance and spiritual renewal. According to the witness of scripture, the young king Jehoshaphat was able to remain loyal to the Lord and he sought to walk in his commandments. In his character and through his conduct, Jehoshaphat honored the Lord and the Lord honored Jehoshaphat. Second Chronicles 17 verse 3 says, And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the first ways of his father David and sought not unto Balaam, but sought to the Lord God of his father and walked in his commandments and not after the doings of Israel. Therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand and all Judah brought to Jehoshaphat presence and he had riches and honor in abundance. 
Church from Arabia, they brought large flocks of sheep and goats from Philistia. They brought tribute and wealth to the people of God. The young king Jehoshaphat used the riches he obtained to build castles and fortresses throughout Judah. And for many years, under Jehoshaphat's rule, the people of God lived in peace, unthreatened by the armies from the surrounding nations. But near the end of his rule, the kingdom of Judah was suddenly and maliciously invaded by armies from Moab, Ammon, and Seir. A messenger was sent to the king saying, there cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea. Behold, they are already in Tamar, which is in Gedi. Brothers and sisters, even though the young king Jehoshaphat for years had been strengthening his armies and fortifying his cities, he was smart enough to know that without God, you are never prepared. Without God, you are never prepared to meet any enemy who threaten your security. Jehoshaphat was smart enough to know that he should not place his trust in the arm of flesh. So in the grip of an emergency, Jehoshaphat knew that he should not rely on the power of Israel's war machine or her battle-ready troops he was smart enough to know that in a moment of calamity and emergency, it's a mistake to rely on the power of Israel's might, on her armor or battlements. And so led by divine wisdom, Jehoshaphat, the Bible says, fearing God more than man, sought the Lord with all his heart in the privacy of his royal chambers and sometimes even in the glare of public view Jehoshaphat sought the Lord he knew that when you have battles to fight and you need the Lord to fight for you when you need the blessings of shelter and protection you have to both fast and pray. And so that day, Jehoshaphat proclaimed a fast in Judah. He gathered the people together to ask help of the Lord. And they came from every city and hamlet. Men and women, children, they stood together in the outer court of the temple, listening as Jehoshaphat lifted his voice in prayer to help toward heaven. Second Chronicles 26. He said, O Lord God of our fathers, art thou not God in heaven? And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand thee? Verse 6, he prayed, O Lord God of our fathers, art thou not God in heaven? Jehoshaphat was saying, God, you're still God, right? <laughs> you, you, you still rule over everything and everyone, right? And in thine hand is still power, right? None is able to withstand thee. And he prayed, if when we cry unto thee in our affliction, will thou not hear and help? Hear and help. Hear us and help us. Behold, the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir have come to cast us out of the land that you've given us to inherit. Then he said, Lord, we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. And neither do we know what to do. But our eyes are upon thee. 
I want you to know, brothers and sisters, there are few prayers more eloquent, more guaranteed to enter the ear of God than that simple prayer, Lord, we don't know what to do. You ever prayed like that? Lord, I don't know what to do. The servant of the Lord says, when you get discouraged, do not depend upon human beings for aid. She says, Christ declares the comforter shall be with you. So go right to God in prayer. Bow before him saying, Lord, come on, read it with me. Lord, help me. Help me. For I am in difficulty and I do not know what to do. You have promised to give your children what they ask in your name. Friends, the condition of helplessness is not a condition reserved for the down and out and the destitute. I want you to know I know some rich people in this world and a whole lot of times they don't know what to do. Money doesn't give you wisdom. Money doesn't give you insight. People who have every luxury and privileged lives, they have circumstances that leave them dumbfounded, baffled, not knowing what to do. Just because you're rich in material blessings doesn't mean you'll be rich in insight and wisdom. Some rich people don't even know what to do with their riches. <laughs> Say, that's the kind of problem I'd like to have. Lord, I got all this money. I don't know what to do. <laughs> Jehoshaphat said, Lord, we don't know what to do. We have no answers. We are helpless. By the way, by the way, I want you to know something about your pastor. There's a prayer I pray often. I pray it all the time. Lord, without you, I'm nothing. I pray that prayer all the time. Lord, without you, I am nothing. And then I add, and I'm going nowhere. Jehoshaphat prayed, Lord, our eyes are upon thee. Lord, we are looking to you for direction. Come on, is there anybody in this church who wants to pray that prayer this morning? Lord, I'm looking to you for direction, for protection, and help. The Bible says, in answer to their prayers, then came the Spirit of the Lord filled up the place. And Jehaziel, who was God's prophet, God's spokesman and mouthpiece, he said three things. First he said, hearken ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Listen to what I'm about to say. And then Jehaziel said three things. He said, there are three things God told me to tell you in answer to your prayer. And they are, one, for the battle is not yours, but God's. And two, you will not need to fight in this battle. Second Chronicles chapter 20, 17. And then thirdly, for the Lord will be with you. Brothers and sisters, this is a triune promise or a three-in-one promise that God gave to his people in answer to their prayer. The battle is the Lord's. Number one. Number two, you don't have to fight. And number three, the Lord is with you. 
the Bible tells us that upon hearing this word from the Lord, Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord with him. Oh, you know, I, I, I got to tell you, I've been in ministry a long time and there's nothing more powerful that a church needs or a conference needs than true, spiritual, courageous leaders. People who can lead. You know what the servant God says? He says the greatest need or want of the world is men who will not be bought or sold. I want you to know, it, sadly, sadly, in our administrations of our churches, and we have religious politicians. We don't have men who will not be bought or sold. Men who are in their innermost souls, true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the North Pole. Men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. The Bible says Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. Thus saith the Lord, Fear thou not, neither be dismayed. Tomorrow, I almost want to sing that one. Tomorrow, go out against them. Face your problems. Face your situation. For the Lord will be with you. In other words, man your battle station. But you won't need to fight in this battle. Take up your positions and then all you have to do is watch the Lord fight. Oh, and my God, it's an awesome thing when you give it to God and you can just stand back and watch him fight your battles. In this battle, the Lord says, I want you to relax, stand back, stand still, and you'll see the salvation of the Lord because I, the Lord, have heard your prayer. Just remember that triune promise. What is it? The battle is the Lord's. Secondly, you don't have to fight. And thirdly, the Lord is with you. Well, the Bible tells us in the morning, Jehoshaphat and all of Judah, they rose up and went into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they advanced to the field of battle, Joshua gave, uh, Jehoshaphat gave a command and it was the kind of command you only can give when you are absolutely confident you're in a battle you will win. Oh, I'm going to get happy all by myself. He gave the kind of command you can only give when you are absolutely confident you're in a battle you will win. When you're confident in the power of God, the favor of God, and in this triune promise of God, Jehoshaphat was so confident he was in a battle he would win that he placed at the head of his army, not his horsemen, not his footmen, not his archers or his chariots. Jehoshaphat placed at the head of his army marching onto the field of battle his choir, his praise team. Oh my God. He was so confident he was in a battle he would win. To lead the battle, Jehoshaphat wanted Worshippers, not warriors. <laughs> Hallelujah. He wanted worshipers, 
not warriors. And so he sent his choir out in front of the soldiers. And I can see it now. Faith-filled worshipers leading the charge. Faith-filled worshipers confident that number one, the back, come on, every time I say number one, you say, come on, number one, the battle is the Lord. Number two, you don't have to fight. And number three, the Lord is with you. And boy, that must have been a sight. A, a choir, a singing choir of soldiers worshiping, celebrating, celebrating the triumph that God had promised to them. Anybody know that when you let him, the Lord will fight your battles? I said, anybody know the Lord will fight your battles? You can march into your battles worshiping. Come on, somebody, help me. You can march into your battles in worship, singing, exalting the name of God. You can say, I thank you, Lord, for the victory that you have already promised. Look at what the servant of the Lord said. She says, if more praising of God were engaged in now, hope and courage and faith would steadily increase. The Bible says, and when they began to sing and, and praise, the Lord said, you know what the Lord said? He said, well, let me read, let me read it from you in NIV. It says, as they began to sing and praise, the Lord ambushed those people. <laughs> the Lord can ambush you, you know. God set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah and they were defeated. While they were worshiping and singing and praising God, God interceded. God intervened on their behalf. While they were worshiping, God interfered. Hallelujah. Come on, God. God got involved and God fought their battles. <laughs> While they were worshiping, God was fighting their battles. The enemy of God's people, they turned on one another and slew and killed each other. Well, as I was preparing this sermon, God put it in my spirit that throughout the Bible there are listed hundreds of battles and wars. Have you noticed? I said, there are, there are hundreds in the Bible. Why did God record for us in his word hundreds of battles and and wars, as a matter of fact, brothers and sisters, have you noticed the history of the world is defined by battles. Battles fought and battles won. As a matter of fact, sin entered the world in a battle. And the book of Revelation tells us that sin will be wiped from the earth in a battle. Look at it, Revelation 12, 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels, what? Fought. There was a battle against the dragon. Fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. That's how it started. It started with a battle. And it's going to end with a battle. Look at it, Revelation 16, verse 14. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that, come on, how did Battle of that great day of God Almighty is going in in a big battle. And all through the Bible, the landscape of history is littered with countless battles and the history of God's people as we know it is an endless litany of battle after battle. As a matter of fact, look, look at some of it. Second Chronicles chapter two, 32, verse six, and he set Captain of war over the people and gathered them together to him in the street of the gate of the city and spake comfortably to them saying be strong and courageous be not afraid dismayed for the king 
of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him, for there is more. For there is more with us than with him. And with him is an arm of flesh, but with us, come on, with us is the Lord our God to help us to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. And, 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 and look at Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 3. And shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint, fear not, and do not tremble. Neither be ye terrified because of them. Verse 4. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to do what? To fight for you against your enemies to save you. And Second Chronicles chapter 14 verse 11 and Asa cried unto the Lord his God and said Lord it is nothing with you to help neither with many or with them that have no power. Help us O Lord our God for we rest not on thee and in thy name we go against this multitude, O oh Lord, thou art our God. Let not man prevail against thee. The wise man, Solomon said, the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. Have you noticed all this battle language? Have you you're noticing all this battle language? David said, some trust In chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They are brought down and fallen, but we are risen and stand upright. Even Jesus in Luke 14, 31 said, suppose a king is about to go to war. <laughs> Did you know Jesus said, a king is about to go to war against another king. But he first, Jesus said this. He must first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000 men. Jesus was saying, Jesus was saying, before you go to war, count your troops. You don't know how powerful that is, a word. Before you try to buy a million dollar house make sure you can afford it before you go to war oh somebody need to listen to me today God is saying before you go to war count you Jesus said that now why is history as we know it this endless litany of battle after battle well I think it's because God wanted his people to know that life is a battle. Life is not a picnic. God wanted his people to know life is not a bed of roses. And yes, life for none of us is a stroll in the park. Yeah, we look at other people's lives and we think maybe they're doing real good, have no issues, no problems. You don't want their problems. You don't want their lives. You don't want mine. And I sure enough don't want yours. I believe God wanted us to know the life. Come on, come on. You better buck it up. Understand, God throughout his word is telling us life is a war and as we face the personal problems in our lives no matter how idealistic or optimistic we are God wants us to remember life is warfare hey and it's not just warfare for you it's warfare for everybody so stop with the pity party It's just not you that have problems. Everybody's got issues. <laughs> hey, help me, Jesus. And in our own strength, we are no match for the cunning of demons. And if we're going to win in this war, in this war, all our techniques and abilities, are, all our past successes, are, 
our personal experiences must be swallowed up in worship. Like Jehoshaphat, we have to remember this triune promise. One, oh, y'all forgot already. One, the battle is the Lord's. Two, you don't have to fight. Three, God will take up your cause as his cause. He'll step in. And when God steps in, when God casts his shadow over your problem, your enemies will flee. Look at Deuteronomy 28 verse 7. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be what? Smitten. Come on before thy face. They shall come out against. they come coming with you one way. But when you flip your head and turn back, they'll be running out seven ways. God was the strength of Judah in this crisis and he is the strength of his people today. So to, to triumph, we have to, number one, oh, come on, come on. I'm going to do this a few more times because you got to get this today. Number one, the battle is the Lord. Number two, you don't have to fight. Number three, Remember it in that order, because I'm not going to mess you up. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do it just like that. You must remember that God alone has all power. He is your strong tower in every emergency. Brothers and sisters, as we face our struggles and our personal problems, I, I may not have enough, but God's resources are limitless. Tell yourself, I may not have enough, but he does. And any battles that seem impossible to win will only make the victory sweeter when I do win. Church, the Lord has your pastor on an unusual journey. First of all, anybody know in America life is not a rose garden? Anybody know in America life is warfare. And I don't know any other way to put it, as lovely and as beautiful as your life may be. If you are living in America, you are living in this world, and you better stay close to Jesus. Because every day, it's war. Every day you're doing battle with forces who are plotting your downfall, seeking your ruin. Every day there are forces seeking to bankrupt you. You live in a country, every piece of mail you get, you gotta bet you better check it because somebody's trying to get their hand in your pocket. Ephesians says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. If you are living in America, you have to face the fact that Satan and his angels have made you and me and your grandchildren the special target of their hatred and rage. And though our eyes can't see it every day, Satan and his angels are holding symposiums and conferences and planning strategies on how best to frustrate you. How to defeat you. Every, come on, I'm giving you real talk right now. Every day they counsel together on how best to continue their warfare against you. How to keep the will of God from being fulfilled in your life. You mean to tell me that there are demons who are planning how to stop the will of God from being fulfilled 
in my life? I want you to know this is a sermon a faithful pastor has to preach periodically to remind God's people every day we as believers are at war with an invisible network of modern day saboteurs every day. We as believers are battling with modern day assassins. Modern day demonic destroyers. Life is no picnic. Life is war. We are at war with demons, an invisible network of killers and egalitarian butchers who don't care who we are or where we came from. They believe that we are doing battle and they are organized, they are united. As a matter of fact, one of the scariest things I've ever read in the spirit of prophecy is that demons are so wicked that they hate one another. Huh? <laughs> they, they hate you are, you are being bombarded by an invisible network. They hate one another. But she also says they put aside their hate and come together in unity to get you They operate from the shadows. They don't care who they maim, who they kill. You're at war with an invisible network of murderers who specialize in calamities and disasters. They collide cars and crash airplanes. They launch viruses and germ warfare. They spread tumors and cancer and sickness and death. They prey upon the naive and the unsuspecting. They destroy the futures of our own children. This is war. Who ever heard of drugs that you can die from just touching them? That's what we have in America today. You've ever heard of fentanyl? You just touch it, you'll die. Every day we as Christians are not fighting armies and soldiers we can see. We're fighting an invisible network of demonic guerrillas. And they are fighting for your mind, for your affection, for your loyalty, for your allegiance. And the battlefield is your heart and mind. Church, this fight is not one of physical might. It is a contest of a struggle within the human spirit. The invisible network of demonic forces they even use psychological warfare. They, they are, right now, they are playing games with our minds. What do you think is going on on television with all this, and on, on the internet with all this fake news and false news, and now they've got technology, they could take your voice and make you say stuff you've never said. They, come on, somebody. They're playing games with your mind. They're depression and despair and discouragement and loneliness, addictions, carnal lust. We are at war with a wily foe, an elusive chameleonic enemy who comes at us in the form of fashions and trends, in the form of stresses and peer pressure. Believe me, they are working with greater intensity today because they know their time is short. I tell people time is running out so fast, you barely have time to change your mind. Oh, but thank God we've got this triune promise. And like Jehoshaphat, we know that one. Okay, okay, you're getting there. One. The battle is the law. Two, we don't have to fight. Three, the Lord is with us. Before I close, lately God has been laying a burden on my heart. And I'm gonna, you're going to hear more about it. It's a burden for people of all races who are born in this country. 
but especially native-born African-Americans. You're going to hear your pastor talking more about this. Because you see, more than most other people, native-born Americans, African-Americans particularly, are the casualties of this war. When we see, you know, sometimes we look with, Lord Jesus, Lord said I could say, immigrant eyes. And we see reports of crime on TV and we forget this is war. And even people who have free will are casualties in this war. And for some reason, lately, God has been making my heart especially tender towards the native-born African-American community in this country. Maybe it's because I've got my dream academy and I see the communities that these kids live in every day. I see what they have to fight and how they have to fight every day just to walk the streets. I'll never forget walking with third, fourth graders and cars pulling up, drug deals going down. And all they're doing is walking home from school. And God, God put some things, I want to share a few things with you before I leave you today. God must have a mighty purpose for a people that the devil and his demons would work so hard to wreak such havoc among them. God must have a mighty purpose for, the, for a people that the devil would work so hard. Some people look at our urban communities and the crime and policing and they, and they look at it with disgust. Some of us look at television and we see the killings, we see the robbery, we see the foolishness and the drugs and, and we look at it with disgust. We look at on this community with disgust. But when I look at it, I, I, I try to keep in mind it's war. And the real culprits in this war we are fighting, we cannot see. The people we see are the kids. Casualties. Because these demons know if you can destroy the family, you can destroy the future of a people. And I will never forget how God reminded me one day the family is still at the foundation of a healthy nation a healthy community, and a healthy church. And God revealed to me that <laughs> native-born African Americans come from the only people group who did not come to this country as families. All of us came and sent for somebody. Every one of us sent for somebody. Uncle, father, cousin, sister, brother. But native-born African-Americans, they're the only ones who didn't come to this country as families. 
My wife, when we go to her father's grave plot, my wife's father was born in 1882. Linda's father was born in 1882, and his father was born early in the 1800s, a slave. So Linda's grandfather was a slave in America. They couldn't send for extended family. No, who would want to? <laughs> Talking about, come on over here, got free room and board. Yeah. <laughs> and then God showed me something. Storms always take out trees with the weakest roots first. And native born African Americans have the weakest family roots. So when the societal storms of crime and divorce and drugs come through a community, they're taken out and rooting up the trees with the weakest family roots. And then after the societal storms have come through, you got social fragmentation, economic inequality, family breakdown, and other problems. I don't know what, and God gave me this this morning as I was praying. Ooh, I hope you're listening. God said, if you gave any race of people the history of family disintegration experienced by the children of the diaspora, that race would have the same problems we see in the African American community. Did you hear what I just said? If you gave Asians or Hispanics, if you gave Caucasians, if you gave any race of people the same history, you'd be going to their communities for the crime. And brothers and sisters, in their efforts to grow, the church has not yet learned how to communicate well to native-born African Americans and to all native-born Americans, regardless of their race. Instead, our efforts, help me, Jesus. Ah, hallelujah, I know you're with me, Lord. In our efforts to grow the church, we have depended upon immigrant patterns rather than develop the spiritual creativity and innovation to grow the church among native-born Americans. Did you know that by the year 2050, nearly one in five Americans will be foreign-born? And as an immigrant myself, yeah, I am just like many of you. I am concerned about my native-born American children. My native-born African American grandchildren. And I'm not going to sit back and eat my roti and ackee and codfish and that and say I don't have to worry about them reaching winning and saving people born in this country is a battle we need to sign up for We need to sign up for it. You know, my wife, born in this country, granddaughter of a slave, she lived next door to an immigrant family from the Bahamas. Sister Forbes, And from when she was a little girl, three, four, five years old, this 
immigrant family would take this native-born African-American child and let her spend the weekends at their house. They bought a little church dresses that they kept pressed and clean and hanging at their house. So if she wanted to wear those pretty dresses, she went to church. I call it Holy Ghost bribery. <laughs> but she, when this native born African American child in a seven day Adventist immigrant home would see them praying together on Friday night, saying grace at a table, bringing in the Sabbath, a dream was born in one little girl's heart. Please, God, that's the kind of home I want when I grow up. And this little girl started praying, Lord, Maybe one day you let me marry somebody like a minister. <laughs> this is the most difficult mission field we are going to face native born Americans native born Hispanic Americans native born any kind of American and we are going to have to sign up because it's not going to be long we're, we're, this world is about to end real soon. I, I, we're, we're coming in for a tough landing, yo. You know, I've been flying. I've been I'm on airplanes. Lord, can I tell this story? I've been on planes all my, I've been on planes so long. I remember when you didn't need ID to get on a plane. I know y'all can't even, young people can't even imagine that. But you, you, you could just go on a plane. As a matter of fact, one time, one time, I ran up to get on the plane. This is time you needed to have a license or something, and I didn't have my license. I forgot my wallet at home, and, and, and the lady looked at me, and I'm trying to say, but I gotta get on this flight, and a thought came to me. I reached in my bag, and I got a CD <laughs> with my smiling face on it, and I held it up. I said, that's me. She said, okay, go board the flight, board the flight. That's how long I've been flying. And I remember the times when the pilot would come on in a storm and say, we're about to go in for a rough landing. We're about to go in for a rough landing, church. And I need, and we need, the church, God needs some of us to sign up to reach the most difficult mission field there is native born Americans. Pray with me. Father in heaven, No preacher should ever sugarcoat this message. Lord, according to the prophetic forecast, the next event on your calendar is the arrival of your son to this earth. Lord, we need your power we need your wisdom as we turn our hearts and minds to this mission field. P 
people born in this country. I ask, oh God, that you would show us we like Jehoshaphat, we are saying, Lord, we don't know what to do. We need your help. And we believe you will give us your help. And as we march into this battle, may we never fear. Because we know the battle is the Lord's. We know we don't have to fight. And we know the Lord is with us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to leave you with a song today. I pray you're blessed. Listen to the words. of trouble come, oppression storm beats at your door, no need to fear. No need to fear, though evil seems so strong, their pride and power is not for long. Be still, my soul, and trust in God, and place your life in Oh, he will never, never fail you. And in the morning, you'll see his face. No need to fear. Don't fear. The envy and the scorn of those who boast in what they own. No need to fear, for what remains when life's brief day Their glories are a setting sun. But as for me, of this I'm sure God will redeem my soul from death and he. Never fail me, and in the morning I'll see his face. Oh uh -huh.
brothers and sisters you have heard a message you have heard the song no need to fear no need to fear and so with that I would say may the Lord bless you and keep you may his face shine upon you May you, may his peace be upon each and every one of us here as we remember these few words. No need to fear. May God bless you. Until then.
Christ is coming 